So you kill me, and you're rich? Don't miss a trick, do you? It seems awfully complicated. You'd get caught immediately. Not necessarily. I might not look it, but I've got lots of imagination. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rowling. Each episode of the Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. We are at episode 54 and that is Erica's choice, so let's find out what she has chosen today. I selected Purple Noon from 1959, directed by René Clément with Alain Delon, Maurice Ronet, and Marie Laforêt. It's based on The Talented Mr. Ripley by Patricia Highsmith about a young man who covets his friend's life and is ready to assume that life by any means. Now, before we get started, I've got a minor spoiler alert for the episode. Okay. Which is that I will probably reflect on Alain Delon's physical beauty many times. I don't think anyone out there that understands the show considers that a spoiler at all. Okay. I think when you said by any means necessary... You clearly meant by handsome means necessary. That is one of his many weapons. Well, with that caveat established, let's get to the film. Okay. We begin with that opening credits sequence. I think it establishes a certain feeling of Hitchcock, especially with those Saul Bass style credits. There's a little bit of that. It also establishes luxury right away because seaplanes aren't cheap. And there are all those picture postcards changing into different colors. And that backdrop becomes the beauty of the Mediterranean. It is a bit of a compressed travelogue in just a few minutes. And so right away we have this tone of travel amongst the idle rich. And the last color that we land on is purple. But of course that has no bearing in the Americanized title of the film. The original French title is Plein Soleil, which is basically full sun. Which I think makes much more sense when you are considering the type of criminal that he is, and you're comparing this to a genre like film noir, for instance. All of his transgressions occur right out in the open, and that is central to the type of criminal that Tom Ripley truly is. And a bit about this adaptation, they leave the characters as American, which, to me, thinking of that period in history makes a lot of sense. You think of Americans as having that level of wealth that they can just leave and go bounce around Europe forever, seemingly. And so that will often, though, be at odds with some characterizations a bit later on, and with some mannerisms and accents. Do you think that it's also no accident that it conveys a certain boorishness, a certain crudeness, or is that just coincidental? I think that is completely in keeping with the story and the plot. I also wrote down the word craven at one point, and I think of cravenness as being an American attribute. I might quibble with that one. Craven has a certain connotation to me that does not carry the sort of audacity that you see in a character like Ripley, at least in this presentation of Ripley. Again, like I often do, splitting fine semantic hairs, but I don't know that that nails it for me. Gotcha. And I think we'll be addressing this as well when we get into certain scenes. Well, if you were going strictly by the cinematography, it should be blue noon because it is Mediterranean Sky blue, sea blue, blue everywhere. It's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen on film. So why purple? Thank you for mentioning that cinematography by Henri Decaille, by the way. It was his first time working in color. Now, as to blue or purple or that title, I struggled for years with this one. I have never heard purple noon as any sort of a phrase, have you? Mm, Doesn't ring a bell. And so I couldn't figure out why they had chosen that. I hadn't seen it really written about before either, except for other people to scratch their heads at. I did find, buried in some odd little, I think even message board, someone mentioned the Yeats poem that specifically references, there's midnight all a glimmer and noon a purple glow, an evening full of the linnet's wings. Yeats was was making midnight and noon into eerie images. Now, Take that for what you will. 
I had started with saying that we were going to get right into the film, and then I took us on a bunch of tangents. Sorry. Okay. So we'll get back into it. What sets this first section apart from me in this latest viewing that I had, I'd seen it a few times before this, was the use of triangles in the composition. It's the constant use at any given point of three people and those shifting dynamics. So we first begin with Philippe and Tom. Tom is Tom Ripley, as we established. Philippe is Philippe Greenleaf. In the novel, it's Dickie Greenleaf. They're both Americans. Philippe is the rich one. Tom is not. We learn that they've had some sort of a friendship for a number of years. And Tom has been sent by Philippe's father to bring Philippe back home to San Francisco. The other things that we learn in this first section, the casual way that Philippe tells Tom what to do, the way he treats him, Tom's ability with his forgery. Which I love as a detail that evokes more, because forgery is part of a set of skills, usually. It's never just the one thing you do by itself. Good point. Confidence men, they have a repertoire, and that is always one of many. I love that, that that's the one that's pointed out to suggest that there is more going on there. And in these shifting triangles, we get introduced to Philippe's friend, Freddy, his American friend. This is my favorite encounter in the first act of this thing. Love it. Great way to establish this. And I love that they made Freddy an actual American, an actual American actor plays him Mm. with that terrible accent. It's Freddy and his ladies. And that gives way to Philippe and Tom and Freddy and how resentful each can be of the other's relationship. There's absolutely mutual disdain, and that is because they know what each other is. You can smell your own, basically, and they can tell each one of them is completely deserving of that disdain, though neither of them is somehow more superior to the other. Now, Freddy is of the same moneyed class as Philippe, and this inherited wealth somehow makes him feel superior to Tom, whom he characterizes as making it off of others, which is something I can't relate to or explain, that sense of how easy it is for a rich person to somehow feel better than a poor person. The whole thing constantly while I was watching it this time, which I liked a lot more the second time I saw it, by the way. And you enjoyed it the first time. Loved it the first time, even better the second time, because I could pay more attention to atmospherics and mood and think of other things rather than just trying to keep up with the turns of the plot. The thing I was thinking about the whole time was Torsten Veblen's The Theory of the Leisure Class and Conspicuous Consumption and The Half-Educated Man and all of those ideas in that book, which, although this movie came decades after that still clearly illustrate just exactly that thing you're talking about. The moneyed elite and their view of the middle class or working class. And Freddy here is fat and soft. In this particular triangle, what do you calculate to be the accumulated hours worked in their entire lives total between the three? It took more work for Philippe to put that ensemble together of the jacket open to the waist with no shirt on and the chain and the pants and to get his hair just right and his tan just right. Not any sort of sustaining or building on this wealth that has been created by generations before him. Interesting. Now that you say that, does that make this set of characters somehow less attractive, less appealing, or is it the same exact thing that we see now with, say, the Kardashians and reality television and wanting to peek into that, that lifestyles of the rich and famous, you have this envy. You have this mini Ripley complex yourself if you are the person who is wanting to watch what these people do. I am so with you on this and that's also why I think it is incredibly appropriate to maintain their Americanness mm. in this story. I think that there are little Ripleys watching E! Entertainment at any point. <laughs> and thank you so much for bringing up the concept of attractiveness. Well, you can't get away from it in this particular case because Clement And his instincts are absolutely correct in that no matter what's going on, you can never go wrong with a close-up of Delon. Is it any wonder that with that first profile of him that is so beautiful that this movie was burned into my brain (laughs) after I saw this when I was, I think, about 20? Mm. Did you have the poster in your dorm? Oh, I wish. (laughs) 
If I had had that next to my Duran Duran poster, I would have kissed that at night. So let's talk here about Tom and Philippe, who they are, what they want. Philippe to me is thoroughly loathsome, which makes the feelings that I have around his subsequent murder slightly ambiguous, only slightly. I'm not a fan of murder. I've come out to say that. <laughs> I'm, I've run on that principle. Right. Let's go back and cover a few of the things throughout the history of the show now. Anti-Nazi, anti-murder. Yes. yes, but Philippe is a dick. The kind of person who would destroy the work of his quote-unquote love in a fit of petulance. A person who is quite physically attractive. He's pretty hunky. But who is emotionally repulsive. He cannot be alone. He has this soft life. I don't enjoy soft life. Do you have any additional thoughts on Philippe? Just that I would say in his case, I am pro-murder as well at the exact moment that he throws her research into the sea. I would kill you myself if you did that. That's unforgivable. But beyond that, I think you've summed it up nicely. Now on to Tom. Ripley is now a character after all of these decades that's been written about, filmed in many different iterations, talked about. There's probably not a ton that I can add that hasn't already been gone over, but just to summarize for people who might be new to Ripley, I'm thinking about who he is and what he wants. I've mentioned in the past, specifically in our Ants in the Pants episode, when I brought up the American Friend, which is Dennis Hopper's characterization of Ripley that I love. The film from the 90s with Matt Damon as Tom Ripley, which chose, I think, to go down a very specific path of bringing up the overt or covert homosexuality underpinnings. And I think in that film, Tom seemed to want to be Dicky, Philippe in our film. In this view, I really think that Tom doesn't want to be Dicky, but wants to have those things. It's all about the material wealth, the material possessions. I don't even think of him as sexual, but more asexual. I truly think of him finally as a psychopath of infinite yearning. Well, I think we differ quite a bit right here, actually. I don't think we can remove sexuality from the equation. Asexual to me implies outside of that, where he clearly employs those things as a tool. To me, omnisexual is probably much more accurate. Pansexual. Whatever it takes, in whatever form, he will do or be that thing. I am completely with you from the mechanics angle of what he is able to do. I don't think that he feels anything. I point to one thing to counter your argument about what he feels and who or what he wants to be and or assume. Clement definitely downplays the homosexual subtext of it because there is always this seduction of Marge that's in the margins. And it's one of those scenes in particular that points out to me that he wants to supplant specifically Philippe when he has her play her guitar for him. And he insists that she play for him. All of that felt extremely personal and extremely specific, and it didn't have to do with, oh, this could be anyone, anywhere, anytime. He very much needed and wanted that right then. I still disagree with you. I think it was a complete tactic, and if it had been any other person who had assumed Philippe's wealth, he would have done the same thing. The other thing that has me on the opposite end of that argument is the amount of time he has spent over the course of his life, on Philippe in particular. If you are... Someone who is just hopping from lily pad to lily pad, committing crimes of opportunity, which seems to me more what you're describing. Anyone, anytime doesn't matter. You would not invest years and cultivate a relationship like this to exploit it. It's more personal than that. It's not a series of indiscriminate random targets. And he doesn't continue to commit crimes except out of self-preservation afterwards. If he was that type of criminal seizing on whatever opportunity whenever, I don't think we would see the depth of relationship between the two of them. I still disagree. <laughs> I think he simply fixated on the richest person in his circle. Once he understood what that wealth meant, this was the convenient target. And so he began laying that plot, even though I do think for the most part, he's making it up as he goes along. Oh, there's definitely that. He is not a very well-considered criminal. No. 
I still think it is for the ultimate angle of getting that sort of money. And this seemed to be the path of least resistance. Okay. You're wrong, but okay. Okay. I think that just means we're going to have to watch it again and again and again. Okay. And anyone listening will back me up. They can just respond on Twitter. Thank you. And moving on. (laughs) Getting back into this main action, I'm again thinking about all the different combinations of threes. So I really want everybody to take a look at that when they watch this again. Tom is the one who's always slightly behind. He's the third. Now they have this silly night where they roam about the town. And then the next morning, there's a scene with this ballet company. Before we skip through that too quickly, I do want to mention that in that sequence of their night on the town, there is a nice little bit of characterization that shows just what we were talking about with this American boorishness. Not even necessarily American, but that of the idle rich the sequence where they negotiate to buy the blind man's cane, and it is very clear that other people's infirmities are their novelties. It's all just amusement to them. And like you said, those jokes are of the most boorish caliber. If you saw these people out and about, and you will at some point, you would just think, God, I'm glad I'm not friends with them. Now back to this action in the morning with this ballet company which I mentioned just to talk about how interested I was in the composition of the frames in this first section, the way shapes and combinations matter. It reminds me of something we saw a few years ago. It was a dance performance. And in one scene, I think there were about nine dancers on stage. And I remember you specifically mentioning afterwards how interested you were to see how the different pairings and combinations changed the story. How interesting it was to think of the choreographer coming up with those different combinations. Do you remember that night? I do. And you bring it up in this case both because it has a literal application as we're watching these dancers and as we're watching these groups of characters in each other's orbit change the narrative depending on who they are in proximity to. I do. And this ballet company doesn't affect the plot in any huge way. It's one of those, again, when you watch something multiple times, those new things that can occur to you. And the new entry into our combinations is now Marge. Marge is Philippe's girlfriend. She's been waiting for them and ostensibly working on this new book. The dynamic between the two of them feels very immature to me. Between Philippe and Marge or between everyone? Good point. Probably everyone, especially between Philippe and Marge. They're supposed to be in their early 20s, correct? Would you guess 22, 23, her at least? Yes. Were you more mature than this at 22, 23? I don't think I was. I'd like to imagine that I might have been, but probably the reality is no. I tend to think of people being able to be on their own in that sort of setting as somehow having certain gifts Mm -hmm. or having certain, I guess to go back to the word, maturity. But those two things don't go hand in hand. No, in this case, it's all about money, right? And their physical and emotional dynamic is... Very troubling, I think, but in keeping with their character. So I want to talk here just a bit about Marge. We've used the word soft before. I think of her as being very soft. A soft doll, a toy, a child. Throughout the film, when Philippe is still around, by the way, she's ready to take him back at any point, even after knock-down, drag-out arguments, after he destroys her work, after she thinks that he's cheated on her. I think of her also as someone who cannot be alone. She doesn't like the behavior that she sees in Philippe and Tom, how Philippe treats Tom, and yet she's unwilling to move away from a person whose behavior she doesn't like. I give her at least a little more credit than the other two. I don't consider her quite as soft because her pastimes, at least, involve some rigor. Dance, academics, these are not things that are easy to do and stick to at the level that she has, so I give her a little more leeway than the two of them. She's at least trying to create something of her own. So I think of this new triangle combination as being the most important. We have this big scene where Philippe catches Tom trying on his things, mimicking trying on a persona in the mirror, even kissing himself, which I don't blame him. (laughs) <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Another point that we mentioned in our Ants in the Pants episode from last time, the literal slipping into his shoes. 
this sequence is another one of those extremely telling things to me just because I think that the type of person that goes into someone's space and just looks around at their things is also pure evil. Completely agreed. So you're saying you've never done that? I've never done that. <laughs> I hear stories about people going through other people's medicine cabinets, looking around. I've seen people do it. I would never in a million years ever do that. Do you know why? <laughs> I'm afraid to ask. Ultimately, I actually don't want to know what your hidden shame is. What kind of Eve you are, are you? I'm assuming that everybody has filthy things in every single drawer, because I know I do. And I don't really <laughs> want to know about that stuff. You can keep that to yourself. I don't think it's shameful, but you can hide it. You can tweet that at me instead, then. Okay. I'm actually quite surprised that Tom allowed himself to be caught. How could you not think that Philippe wouldn't turn the corner and see you doing this? Well, we already have mentioned that forethought is not exactly his strong suit when it comes to these crimes. And if he is truly this type of person, there's always that projection of everyone else is just like me, so I'm not necessarily doing anything wrong, therefore why hide it? There's a little bit of that in play as well. The three of them are now going to get on this yacht to take this trip. And Philippe continues to basically order Tom around on the boat, how to manage the boat, jockeying for position. And then we have this section where they're eating lunch. This is the fill-in of the story about Tom worshipping Philippe and his life, and Philippe's father's disdain for Tom. And he has that brief speech about he wasn't distinguished enough for Philippe's father, and Philippe tries to put him in his place again, that to look distinguished is a lowly ambition, and shows him how to eat properly. It's all just manners, it's not character. Now at the end of the scene, Tom goes away. And Marge takes Philippe to task for the way he's treating him. And Philippe tells her that that story he told about when they were 15 years old wasn't true and that he has not known him all his life. If you are her, or even as you, as a viewer the first time, did you believe Tom? Did you believe Philippe? I believed Tom. How about you? First viewing, I could have gone either way. Second viewing, I believe Tom which I just think supports my thesis of it being extremely personal for him and not just indiscriminate. So maybe I'm just picking evidence that backs up what I'm trying to pitch to you as far as what type of person and criminal he is. But first time around, Philippe is enough of a jerk that I feel like he could just be doing this to amuse himself and to manipulate Marge. And I felt equally that Tom could have just been trying this on as a bit of improv to see how believable he could make something sound. Now, to undermine my own point about his asexuality, I had the idea of Chuck and Buck in my head. Okay. Where I was building in this backstory that maybe they had done something together when they were hmm. younger, and this was an opportunity for, for Philippe to whitewash this history. Okay. That makes sense. Certainly adds a new layer of context to the whole thing. And I think it's so interesting that Tom... Ellen DeLon makes that choice to take his shirt off. I think to show his masculinity, his independence from Philippe after he's been belittled as he goes up to take care of the boat. You mentioned the idea of recognition earlier in the other characters, and Philippe is talking about how he knows that all that Tom cares about is money, which again reminds me of how easy it is for a rich person to find that disdainful. One, easy for them to say. Two, is that a little hypocritical on their part? Because essentially that's all they are doing themselves. They just have the resources to not fret about it constantly. Their entire life is built around the use of money. In this case, the extremely frivolous use of money. At this point, Philippe tells Marge that he's going to send Tom away. And Tom up top has been steering the boat fairly wildly and he causes the dinghy to fall off. Philippe then, in an extended and terrible prank, forces Tom into the dinghy and then sets it back and doesn't realize that it has essentially gone adrift from the boat. And enough time elapses while Philippe and Marge are getting down to business that Tom has a terrible sunburn by the time they catch back up with him. As this day and night and day go on, Philippe has discovered that Tom has some of his financial papers. And they have that 
tense tete-a-tete that we were doing in the opening scene, where Tom is clearly planning something. He has kept an earring from that night where they were roaming around from a woman that they were in a taxi with, planted it on Philippe so that Marge will assume that he has cheated on her. And they also talk about the idea of killing Philippe. And next, this most terrible part, where Philippe, again in this fit of petulance, gets so angry with Marge that he can't get his way that he takes up all of her handwritten work, this book that she's working on, throws it into the sea. More insight into Philippe's character, aside from how terrible and destructive he is prior to that, when she asks him to engage about this, to read the introduction of the book to him. He makes an excuse. He avoids that. What better does he have to do on a boat in the middle of the ocean? He clearly does not value her at all. And she says this to him, though I think when you hear it, it comes off as a sense of validation that she's seeking. You don't care about my work and you don't love me. She just wants him to say it. But this thing that he does, this is what causes her to decide to get off the boat. Now, Tom offers to go with her, but I felt that this was really hollow because I think he knows that Philippe cannot be alone and that it was just an empty gesture. Not so much hollow as calculated, betting on what the two of them would insist he do. Making him, in Marge's eyes, seem like the sincere and put-upon one. Is that a bit of an unnecessary move right there? Because he is clearly already that in her eyes. He is clearly the one who is downtrodden and abused by Philippe the way she is. They are already allies in that way in Marge's eyes. I think the calculation further comes from the fact that at this point, I don't think she really likes Tom. There's something in her that doesn't respond to him in the way that she does to Philippe. So this is an opportunity for him to eventually turn that corner, I think. And Marge leaving the three of them so that it's now just the two, it's just Tom and Philippe, is where I think of as the end of this first section. And now we're down to two, Tom and Philippe. Who do you think comes out on top? (laughs) Philippe doesn't stand a chance. And Philippe doesn't stand a chance for very long, because as they are bantering on the boat, Marge is gone, about how Tom could possibly kill Philippe and get away with it, he takes the opportunity to stab him during a card game. And this next section is pretty tense as he's trying to take care of the boat and get Philippe's body away and overboard. And there's this great bit of serendipity that as he is wrapping Philippe's body in the tarp, Alain Delon, the actor, is accidentally hit in the head by one of the booms and is thrown overboard. This was entirely an accident. And it's pretty amazing to watch the actor, you don't know that it's an accident, to watch Tom struggle in the water to try to then get back onto the boat, which he does. So he has essentially secured the body, gotten it overboard, dumped it into the sea, as far as he knows. And I love the wrap-up for this scene, which is him almost falling below deck and then shoving food in his mouth as he puts on one of Philippe's shirts. Well, killing is a hungry business. There are two things in this second section that I like an awful lot. One we'll get to in a minute, but this first one has specifically to do with how we've been manipulated as an audience up to now. There are parallels in this, for me, to Psycho and how Hitchcock treated that audience. When viewed as a whole, when you step back and look at the entirety of the story, Tom is terrible. A criminal, a murderer, someone you cannot empathize with at all. But I think right here, up to and including perhaps the murder he commits on board, we are in his corner still because so far what you have seen is what you mentioned already. Third wheel. He's constantly on the outside. He's constantly being belittled and demeaned by Philippe. And so we are put in the position for the first 20 minutes or so of recognizing that he might not be the most virtuous character ever, but we are still on his side because he is the more pathetic of the group. The key to that whole thing, as Clement saw it, is Ripley's humiliation, something that everyone can relate to. And he has endured that now, if you are to believe his story, since they were 15 years old, if not even further back than that. So there is a lifetime of this resentment 
and being treated as a second-class citizen based solely on the virtue of whose bank account is larger. As a result, much like being pushed into supporting Norman Bates as being the dutiful son until we know better, the entire opening fourth or so of this movie, we are being slowly pushed over in Tom's corner, regardless of what we think of his more nefarious character aspects. Because most likely, if we were to be a character in this drama, we would be in his shoes. Or did you see it differently? Were you on his side up to this point? Did you withdraw from him right here? Did you react differently than I'm describing? I don't think so. I wasn't necessarily in his corner, per se. I'm definitely not in Philippe's corner. But at this point, when the story starts to shift, it was all about, will he get away with it? Hmm. So I don't know that I was really pulling for him one way or the other, but I was all on board with watching that play out. And I want to come back to that at the very end. Funny that you mention that, because I felt like the clock was ticking on this from the start, and I knew from the first frame, from the first time we watched it, even if I had been completely unfamiliar with the story or the other adaptations, I knew he was not going to get away with it. That seems built into what the film is telling us from the very first frame. To me, was there suspense in that regard? It was for me, and I want to hold that okay. thought if you okay. don't mind, and we will come back to it. Okay. And now Philippe is gone, and to my mind, not missed, but he is missed by Marge. So Tom goes to see Marge, and this starts the building up of the idea that Philippe is still alive, and he's just somewhere else, and so it's this extended subterfuge that Tom has to engage in. Marge's response to Tom's arrival and his story is my second favorite part of this whole thing, because I think it's demonstrative of that little bit of human nature that, regardless of the evidence, people will twist the narrative to make it fit what they want to believe has happened. I know in her heart Marge knows that something is not right, but she refuses to face that head on. She's interpreting it as, he's still angry with me because of this fight that she didn't cause, and that he's off somewhere or with someone. Initially, sure, and up to a point I can see her going with that, but she takes her belief in this scenario far past anything that makes sense as far as what the evidence is showing. All of those telltale signs that people tell you to watch out for, things that someone has never done before, things that are out of character, typing letters, for instance, rather than writing them. Don't ignore red flags like that. And yet she goes on. Well, it's through all of these machinations, a couple of which you mentioned, where he's trying to build this idea that Philippe is away and out of touch, but is setting up something. Now, Freddie, meanwhile, is still in town, and he has figured out through a couple of those missed connections that Tom is basically assumed Philippe's identity. And this is my second favorite part of the film. In that same fashion, because Tom is improvising as he goes, he realizes that Freddy is onto him, at least for something nefarious, is totally rattled by it, and takes the opportunity to kill Freddy. If anything underlines his impetuous nature and the fact that he is not a master criminal, it is this act right here. From here on, he is scrambling. Whatever minor preparations he made, all of that practicing the signature, all of that stuff goes out the window because he is too greedy, too grasping. He only had a partial plan. And he's at the point now where he is clearly, to me at least, never going to be ahead of it again. It is only going to spiral further and further out of control. And now it's really all just moment to moment. The murder of Freddy, just like with Philippe, takes seconds, but it's the aftermath that's so fascinating to watch. Almost that sense of it's happening in real time as we're watching the day elapse until he can figure out exactly what to do with the body and then how to manage it. And the one moment I love in this sequence too is him descending on that cooked chicken which he has been cooking while Freddy's body has been laying there inside the apartment and then tearing into it. Clement implemented what I think was a stroke of directorial genius right here to get that moment-to-moment -moment feeling that you're talking about. To underline the flying by the seat of the pants, not having a plan going into this feeling, his direction to Delon in this section is essentially, you've gotten yourself into this now, I'm not going to help you. And as a director, otherwise abandoned him for this scene where he is disposing of the body. And I think it translates extremely well when you're watching him struggle down the staircase, all this improvisational giving him a cigarette, it really comes across on screen 
that this guy is alone with this situation, dealing with it as best he can. And I don't know about you, but I was quite surprised to learn how much Clément improvised on the set, created new scenes on the day, allowed the actors to improvise. It would seem to me, at least on paper, to be at odds with a director who is a bit older at that point, who has been directing for many years, but it seems to work so well and so completely fit the idea that Tom is figuring it out as he's going along. Well, I have a lot of things to say about Clément's skill and his relative position to, for example, the French New Wave and how he was perceived by that generation of filmmakers, but I think I'll save that for the wrap-up at the end. Okay. One last thing I do want to say in Clément's own words. A script is like a score that is missing any indication of tempo. You have to breathe life into it. And with the dumping of Freddy's body, I think of that as the end of this second section. There was one thing that Delon did that I liked an awful lot in that body dumping section when they're going down the stairs and he puts the cigarette in Freddy's mouth. He's so money conscious, rather than throwing it away, he stubs it out and saves it. This prop that has been in a dead man's mouth is not to be wasted. That goes back in the pocket. That whole section, I think, is a masterpiece from... Tom looking out the window at the children playing below to the composition of the frames with Freddy's body and the groceries splayed across the floor to the choices that he makes mentioning the cigarette to having him outside leaning up against the car to make people passing by, which would happen, think that he is drunk. At the end of this section, he's successfully able to dump Freddy's body. Now we're moving into this last section. And at this point, with the discovery of Freddy's body, the police are on the trail. They don't know what trail they're on, but they're on a trail. Fair to say the third act is as much a procedural as anything else? It is. It's as much as who is a step behind the other. This is about Tom trying to complete that circle of casting blame elsewhere. So he is starting to set up this new narrative that he's creating, which is that Philippe is the person who killed Freddy. And then he's going to have Philippe kill himself. There's one last use of a triangle that I really love. So after they have gone to see what they discover is Freddy's body in the morgue, Tom and Marge and this ballet company are going to lunch. And there's a woman who inserts herself behind Tom. We know that she is associated with the police and she's doing a terrible job here being surreptitious. He's aware of her behind him. And there's this great three shot. There's Marge and Tom and this woman. And he begins to tell this story to Marge loudly enough so that this woman can hear as he's constructing this idea of what Philippe has done. Now, as this action is moving forward to an ending, Tom is completing this idea, closing the circle. The police think that it's Philippe who killed Freddy, or do they? But at least they say so. And we learned that Philippe's father is coming to town. Tom goes to see Marge, and he, in the guise of taking over Philippe's identity, has created a will, leaving everything to Marge, further setting up this idea that Philippe is about to kill himself, but he also gets a little dig in to try to convince Marge that Philippe didn't love her, and that he's here to say goodbye. And this is the seduction scene. As he's closing this circle in the third act, is where I'm left with a lot more questions. And so many things that happen here seem to point to his deficiencies as a master criminal. Why linger when the bank account is closed down? Why this attempt at seduction? And when Marge wakes to find Tom in her apartment, why not say that's enough? This crosses a line. If it is truly as impersonal as you say, he's gotten everything that he can out of this. The bank account is down to $475, from thousands and thousands? Why is he not on his way somewhere else to do the next thing? I assumed his plan now that he's just come up with is to marry Marge, kill her, take the money. It just strikes me that there are much easier ways to do this than the way he is going about it. This is a lot of work and skullduggery to maintain a lifestyle. That's the ultimate question, right? I mean, the easiest way would have been to get a job 10 years ago. No, suckers work jobs. Good point. And they do not make this kind of money. 
So in order to maintain this lifestyle, you have to keep going. It's a hole you've dug yourself that you have to keep getting out of every single day. So you do that by keeping moving, keeping anonymous, not leaving paperwork, all of which getting married and sticking around long enough to do this would cause. I would say a point in my favor for this argument is that a different time, there's much less paperwork. You can fake things a lot easier than you can right now. And that he, like you have said, is immature and not that bright in order to come up with a master plan for this stuff. So he hasn't figured out that you do have to keep moving. Look, I'm just telling you how I'd do it. Okay. So Noted. <laughs> you know my master plan. Well, the seduction succeeds in part, though I still think from watching her face, there's something about him she doesn't quite like or trust. There's still some part of her, like with this other story about Philippe, that is sending off red flags that she does not pay attention to. She's making out an awful lot with a guy she doesn't like or trust very much. Yes, it's just not in her eyes. There's no sort of adoring that is happening. But she goes along with it, and they have this beach outing. And the action happening simultaneously is that the boat has arrived back to be sold. So it's going into dry dock, and they're lifting it up. Marge goes to meet Mr. Greenleaf while Tom stays behind, and they're watching the boat come up. And the action jumps back and forth between... Tom looking very pleased with himself, relaxing in a lounge chair, ordering a drink. This is the height of his satisfaction. I believe that you could file this under champagne wishes and caviar dreams. <laughs> and then back to the boat as they slowly see it rise and they see the winch working. The body is still behind the boat, tied to a rope trapped around the propeller. So the ruse is clearly over. The police know Philippe is dead. It is Tom who has murdered him. They are now on his trail at this cafe. They get the cafe owner to make up a phone call to get Tom into the building. And as the police are waiting for him inside, our last moment is to see Tom smiling, striding towards this fake phone call. It's a little disappointing to me that he doesn't get away with it. Just in terms of it being somewhat conservative, the way we mentioned with horror films, similar again to the Psycho thing, ultimately justice is served. Almost more than anything, it's reassurance that an audience craves. Do you feel like I do, that most mainstream audiences at least, will forgive any manipulation as long as you set things right at the end? I do agree, at least for a mass audience, and especially of that time. By of that time, do you mean... Less savvy? A little less sophisticated than now? I was thinking more 1959 still feels like, by and large, it was of the period of crime doesn't pay. Okay. And criminals, no matter how incredibly beautiful and adorable and seductive and gorgeous and beautifully shot in color, still can't get away with it. That's what is slightly disappointing about it for me. Because, again, like we mentioned in the Ants in the Pants overview of it, Science proves that attractive people literally get away with more than people considered to be unattractive. Clement did have an ending in mind where he does succeed. Do you think if he'd gone that way that these French New Wave punks would have cut him a little more slack than they did? Hold that thought for just a second. Okay. So in the book, he does succeed. Mm -hmm. So the decision was made, I think, partially because of the time period, to change that. Now, this is the point that I wanted to come back to that I asked us to table a bit earlier. Okay. Which is that I managed to wipe out this unsatisfactory ending from my memory. I had convinced myself, after all of these years of having watched it a few decades ago and then coming back to it fairly recently again, which was that Tom completely got away. I have a vision in my mind that is as clear as day, of Tom walking, striding, smiling like he is doing, down a colonnade, drenched in sun, as the police are far away, and he's able to get out of the movie. I remember that so vividly, I still feel that it is true. And when I watch it again, I think, wait, what? What's happening? What do you think fuels that? Is that you want him to get away with it so much, or is it something else? I think it's so much more believable. And probably I just wanted to see Alain Delon make more movies with, as Tom Ripley. <laughs> well, you got your wish. Not as Ripley, necessarily. But he went on to make several more of the greatest French crime films ever. Most of them were darker, 
more traditionally noir, whereas this is sort of an anti-noir. I say anti, but it's strange now that I think about it. To me, sunlight functions the same way as darkness in this. Sunlight can be as blinding as absolute darkness. So maybe all of that stuff being right out in the open that way is also what your subconscious is responding to when crafting this ending that doesn't exist? Do you think it can possibly go back to that Yeats poem again and the idea that it's casting noontime and sunlight into something very dark, that there's something dark about watching someone so beautiful, who's so perfect, bathed in color and light, and so bad at the same time. I think there's some of that, especially for you, because I think you respond to something that's straight horror, like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, for instance, that occurs in straight-up daylight as much more terrifying than things that happen that go bump in the night. You are absolutely right. I want to give another mention here to cinematographer Henri Decay and a little bit about what I was reading about him. And again, I mentioned that this was the first time that he was using color. And especially in that scene, that accidental scene when Tom is knocked overboard as he's trying to wrap up Philippe's body, René Clément talked about how integral he was to this film, that it was his liking for natural light that made all of this possible and allowed him to work at the speed that he did and then it was Dekai, I'm quoting from someone else, who liberated the camera from its fixed tripod. And you can feel that so much, I think, in that scene especially, that he essentially made the new wave possible. Well, I mentioned how hard a time the new wave gave Clement, with the one exception of Andre Bazin. They looked at his films as stodgy, mannered, outdated, not fresh, not exciting. And I think they really missed something specifically with this movie. What ends up on screen is obviously a more classically composed finished product than something like Jewels and Gem or Breathless. But his creative process on this, full of improvisation, it's meticulously thought out, but it is not chained to that. It is very much driven by impulse, it feels like. I don't know how they feel about it now, but in hindsight, I feel like something like Purple Noon is as much a bridge from the old style to the new wave as anything by Robert Brousson, for instance, who the new wave revered. Aesthetically, obviously he and Clement are at different ends of the spectrum, but in terms of acting as a link from one generation to this new generation, I think they're both as valuable and both as skilled, and sometimes, in fact, it seems to me a little contradictory that they hung on Brousson rather than Clement because Brousson was so rigorous and academic. And when it comes down to it, so much of the new wave is about generating entertainments. I think they have more in common with Clement than they are willing to admit to. And as far as Truffaut's fairly famous dismissal of Clement and that whole style of cinema, he can go suck an egg or an oof. Very nice. Because, to my mind, Shoot the Piano Player is nowhere near the film that this is or that my recommendation is. Okay, slow your roll for just okay. a second. Before we get to recommendations, a couple of other things I wanted to talk about with this new wave, because I think it's fascinating. It almost, to me, feels like a fanboy who got dismissed by his idol and decided to retaliate. I don't know if at some point, and I don't think so, Clement was very complimentary of many new wave artists that at some point he insulted someone behind their back or someone's mother and Truffaut decided just to take it to the next level. It has that sense of bullying almost to me. Now I do think Clement for the most part would be more of an easy target for that kind of disdain because it's someone who did start many decades before, mm -hmm. came up through the ranks, but then because he is of a certain age at that point would wear suits to the set. So he looks very elegant and very mature but in this film created something so beautiful and elegant and yet so many opportunities for ambiguity. He and the screenwriter made so many interesting changes and differences from the source material. He's such a great director of actors. There are so many wonderful things to say about this and I'm a huge fan of the new wave. But if you look at something like Breathless that's so referential, where do you get off trying to disdain something that is a huge reference point? Yeah. Yeah, take that. 
So aside from the obvious things, did we cover why you chose this one? I wanted to expand on just a couple of those ideas that I think I've mentioned throughout the episode. Okay. Do you want me to say one more time that Alain Delon is incredibly <laughs> beautiful? You can if you want. I don't think anyone's going to argue with you. Oh God, I hope not. Okay. This came during the period that I like to call my French period, which in reality lasted roughly 15 years and is actually continuing on. So my whole life is a French okay. period. But I was specifically watching tons of new and old French film all the time. So I was ripe for this film to hit me. I was ripe for the lightning bolt that is Alain Delon. I was so convinced that I understood the character that I created a new ending in my head. And I think possibly because everyone and everything is so beautiful, it constantly seems fresh to me. And like with so many of our choices, I chose this because I want people to see it. I want everyone to find late period Clément and early period Delon, and then go from there. And now, back to your recommendation. Okay. Well, I'm going to follow your suggestion a little bit and stick with Clément for mine, but go back a little bit to mid-period, let's say. And my recommendation is Forbidden Games from 1952, starring Brigitte Fossey and Georges Pujoli. It's about two children struggle to maintain their innocence in the face of wartime atrocity and indignity. But there are two things going on. Underneath that, there's the fact that the mechanism that they use for their self-preservation comes from an innate well of darkness that we can tap into, apparently no matter what age we are. The purity of innocence in this is not so much the polar opposite of the purity of evil, but they are shades of one another. The real reason to recommend it, I think, is Brigitte Fossey, that young girl. She is uncanny. Her performance, I would put that up against almost anybody. Certainly against any other child performance I've ever seen. You mentioned Clement's skill with actors. He obviously knew how to shape what she was doing, but what she gives is utterly transparent in the best way and really perfect, I feel like. What about you? Before I get to mine, I did want to ask a question because I haven't yet seen Forbidden Games, okay. but this is essentially his masterpiece, correct? You can make that argument. It's apples and oranges with something like, let's say, Purple Noon, which could easily be considered a masterpiece as well. I prefer Forbidden Games, and I think the esteem it's held in by the international cinephile community would be in line with what you're saying, but it just depends on what you like a little bit more. That's probably a little bit more of what I'm thinking, that it is so internationally lauded at such a degree. I think that's the idea that I had. Which does bring up something that I forgot to ask about when we were doing the show. I wanted to talk a little bit about the differences in the crime films that we like and how you think Purple Noon represents that. You are more towards the cozy end of the spectrum sometimes. You've got your Murder, She Wrote that you love so much and your Agatha Christie stuff that you love so much. How would you characterize the crime films I like, for instance, versus what you like? Thinking back to my influences and how I got started, you're absolutely right, because I was introduced to Agatha Christie at a very young age. I was brought into early crime film and then modern TV crime film at a young age. So all of that was fairly low stakes. Okay. When you say TV crime film... You're trying to get across to me maybe that the edges were sanded off a little bit. Not nearly as gritty, maybe. Right. You mentioned Murder, She Wrote, Magnum P.I. Okay. You know, you're not going to see anything too, too dark in any of those settings. At least not that I was allowed to watch when I was 10 years old. Okay. Though that started to change when I discovered film noir, which is very, very dark. So I think about the things that I feel like you like and that you've introduced me to being more of an international flair of a certain period, let's take 50s through the 70s, mm. where you're more allowed outside of, say, Purple Noon to show extreme violence and dark moral character. So I think of that territory as extreme mapping of the human soul as to be what you tend to favor. Okay. I think that's pretty fair. I think it just lines up with what I like in film in general emotional turbulence, even if that's portrayed somewhat statically like Once Upon a Time in Anatolia. The action might not be full of upheaval. It may be very slow and deliberate, in fact, but the situations are more murky, not as glossy, not as glamorous, maybe, as what you would see in the 
more lighthearted fare. That makes me think of something else. Ever since I could remember, I've always been very tense watching things. For example, Back to the Future <laughs> makes me really upset because I don't know if he is going to connect those two plugs together to make the whole thing work and get Marty back to the future. So you're a sucker for suspense of any sort. I am sort. a sucker for suspense. So having something maybe more neatly wrapped up, I think appeals to me as a kid because I cannot stand a cliffhanger. Okay. I also have one last bone to pick with you. Okay. <laughs> this whole idea of Once Upon a Time in Anatolia being really slow, you said this to me before we watched it. I think you were trying to prepare me, mm -hmm. which you don't have to do generally. Though I do sometimes have to be in the mood for certain things, talking myself out of my own opinion. But anyway, <laughs> back to Once Upon a Time in Anatolia. I thought it went by in a second. It felt like it went by like gangbusters. And so I don't think of it as the slow thing. As some people might think, slow equals tedious. Mm -hmm. It's definitely not that. So I just want to stop calling it slow. I don't necessarily mean that for your consumption. But if we walk into the theater that's there to see Captain America Civil War and we yank that print and we put on Once Upon a Time in Anatolia, instead, what are the adjectives that they're going to use? First off, that would be hilarious. <laughs> Second, I would not stay for after the screening. You don't I want to see run. The, you don't want to see the comment cards? I'd throw the, the film canisters in the back of our convertible, have it ready to go. You jump in the back and we take off. I feel like I've really gotten a sidetracked here. So <laughs> what is your recommendation? Good point. Well, mine is full of suspense. Okay. And it has many connections to this film and to your recommendation oh, as well. I chose Elevator to the Gallows. Ooh, good one. This was from the year before, 1958. Directed by Louis Malle with Jean Moreau, Maurice Ronet, who was Philippe in this film, and Georges Pujoli, who was in Forbidden Games. It's about a self-assured businessman who murders his employer, who also happens to be his mistress's husband, and then unintentionally provokes an ill-fated chain of events. The title kind of gives it away right. a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. It does telegraph it some. I absolutely love this. It was inspired, of course, because sharing the actor Maurice Ornay. My absolute favorite scene is watching Jean Moreau go through the streets of Paris, thinking to herself, looking for her lover, wondering what's happened. Absolutely wonderful. It's also when I've said to you before, before we went to Paris, I said, it looks pretty much the same and yet slightly different. And I think you totally know what I mean. Now. I do. We did not have the benefit of an immaculate Miles Davis score when we went, but, you know, you can't have everything. So once again, two great recommendations, Forbidden Games and Elevator to the Gallows. And that brings us to the end of episode 54. If you like the show and you would like to support what we do, we encourage you to please check out our Patreon over at patreon.com slash magiclantern. There are lots of fun perks and extras, and at the $5 a month support level, you get extra mini episodes of the show. We just posted one about Old School Kung Fu Weekend, and we have a couple of really fun ones coming up about Judy Garland and our favorite movie theaters. Otherwise, if you would like to get in touch with us, you can reach us at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. You can just search for Magic Lantern Podcast in any of those venues. We are on Twitter at lantern underscore cast and i just wanted to take a second to say thanks to people who have given us feedback or shared the show since the last time jane sankner jeff duncanson travis trudell adam daughter mateo boscarol george eduardo ross mcleod tim lego grindhouse dave andy wolverton mike sharp the stat podcast the yagaday podcast and our brethren over at Fuds on Film. And speaking of those guys, I want to say an extra special thanks to Drew Tavendale, who left us a really nice five-star glowing review on iTunes recently. Someone else left us a rating but no review, so since we don't know who you are, thanks for that anonymously. Basically, any podcatcher that you use, you can typically find us, and we would certainly appreciate it if you would rate and review the show. It gets us in front of more people anytime you do that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, at the website, magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. <laughs>